The number of child soldiers is expanding in many war zones. According to the UN, tens of thousands of children are involved in conflicts in over 20 countries around the world. So, what should be done to stop this practice? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jemjoum. Monday marks the International Day Against the Use of Child Soldiers. It's a problem that shows no sign of ending. In fact, many rights groups and the UN say it's getting worse. There are tens of thousands of children around the world putting their lives at risk. And the global effort to fight this doesn't have the money it needs. In 2015, less than 1% of the estimated $174 billion of international aid was spent on this issue. But it's not all doom and gloom. There has been some progress. At least 5,000 child soldiers were released and integrated into society last year in places like Democratic Republic of Congo. 167 countries have now ratified the international treaty which bans the conscription of children under the age of 18. The UN has highlighted 14 countries where the problem is still a concern. Its figures from last year show more than 3,000 children were recruited by armed groups in Democratic Republic of Congo. Around 40% are girls. In northern Nigeria, UNICEF says Boko Haram used 83 children as so-called human bombs in the first half of last year. That's the practice of forcing children to become suicide bombers. In 2017, the number of child soldiers doubled in the Middle East, particularly in Yemen, with more than nearly 2,000 children, some as young as 10, recruited to fight. And in South Sudan, at least 19,000 child soldiers are involved in conflict. The UN has obtained the release of almost 2,000 child soldiers so far in South Sudan, but the situation remains particularly alarming. Hiba Morgan has been talking to a few former child soldiers in Yambiu. These moves are not new to John. He's been taught how to carry them out for the past two years since he was 15. He didn't learn the drills willingly. John's one of at least 700 children forcibly recruited by the South Sudan's National Liberation Movement. The rest me when we are, we are going to the, to the garden by force. If you want to go alone or if you take his in that you want to go, they will not accept. If they found you, they will just take you again by force. The civil war in South Sudan, now into its fifth year, has killed thousands and displaced millions. Many vulnerable kids were recruited by armed groups to fight both boys and girls, such as 13-year-old Sarah. I was in the garden working and I see these people are coming and I start to run. They call me that, let me come, why am I running? And I stopped running. They said to me that if I run, they will lock, they will shoot me with the gun. And I stopped running and come. Right groups say nearly all armed groups recruited children to fight. The South Sudan's National Liberation Movement has recently released more than 300 children. They were not really forced, but the condition by then uh, forced them and uh, all of us together to stay. So in fact we did not uh, tend purposely so that they may be uh, recruited uh, as the army to fight. That's why you see we have decided also, as we are now in towns after the peace, so that we, we have decided uh, to release them so that uh, they can go to school uh, or join their communities. Nearly 2,000 children have been demobilized in the past five years, but they are being replaced. According to UNICEF, the number of child soldiers in armed groups and armed forces has been on the rise since the war in December 2013. That's despite all warring sides agreeing to stop recruiting child soldiers and releasing those already enlisted. But even for those who have been demobilized, life is a challenge. Many children who have been released have no idea where their families are. For others, fighting has become a way of life. The biggest challenge is reintegration. It's a process that takes time, two to three years, for that child to go back home and resettle. We still have more kids to be released, so access, big thing there. We need more kids to be released. Our real concern is the reintegration of these children so that don't, they don't get re-recruited again. John and Sarah say they don't want to return to the battlefield, but they also fear what lies ahead after their past experiences and wonder if they may be forced to fight again. Hiba Morgan Al Jazeera, Yambiu, South Sudan.
Let's bring in our guests. Joining us on Skype from Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown, Ishmael Alfred Charles, a former child soldier who now works as a program manager at Healy International Relief Foundation. In London, Rachel Taylor, director of programs at the UK-based NGO Child Soldiers International. And from South Sudan's capital, Juba, Brigadier General Lul Ruai Kwang, spokesman for the South Sudanese Army. Welcome to you all. Charles, we talk a lot on this program about the horrors of war, but you experienced it as a child firsthand. You were 14 when you were forced to become a child soldier in Sierra Leone. Could you tell our viewers about what happened to you? Well, of course, um, it was in a village called Kaima in um, Kono District, the Diamond Ferris um, District of Sierra Leone where um, we were in a bush when, um, as we were, co they were cooking, um, the rebels will always find um, the smoke that is going into the air. Um, that's the way they actually uh, identify where people are actually residing. And so they were able to trace us into the bush, and then they appeared um, in the bush and arrested all of us and, and, and took us to the township of Kaima in Sando Chiefdom in Kono District. And so um, there was where we were inscripted, and they started um, teaching us how to shoot a gun and also asked us to, to, to um, carry their, their looted items. So it's, it's, it was a whole process uh, which does not only take a day. I'm only making it a summary because of the, of, 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 um, we're doing an interview, but um, it's a long process of induction and indoctrination into um, actually buying into the ideologies and also understand um, firearms processes and also um, how to maneuver in a circumstance where um, government forces or the ECOMOG, uh, which is the ECOWAS uh, fighting force that was actually supporting the government of Sierra Leone at a given time in um, outstanding the, the, the rebels' activities. So uh, it was a whole process wherein um, I never wanted to be part of them, unfortunately. So I was always looking for rooms and opportunities to escape but also have been cognizant of the fact that if you're caught while you're trying to escape, you're actually going to be killed immediately because they will see you as a spy. Rachel, this is all very complicated subject matter. I want to try to break this down a bit for the viewer. Could you tell us what are the primary causes of children being used by armed groups in times of conflict and war? I think the use of children by armed groups and even by state armed forces has a very long history. And although the types of conflicts that we're seeing nowadays have developed somewhat over the previous century, the reasons why children and young people become involved in these groups have remained fairly constant. Primarily, it's due to uh, lack of access to resources, to education, to security primarily, um, to food, to employment. And in contexts where young people see no other uh, provider of these kinds of things, they often find that they have no other option except to join these groups. Um, so although there are a great many children who are compelled, who are forced or abducted and join armed groups that, that way, it's really important to remember that for a lot of young people, it's not that they have been forced in that manner, that they've been kidnapped and forced to fight, but that they ha just simply have no other options. And that's an area where we need to focus more resources as a preventive measure. General Kwang, when we're talking about child soldiers, South Sudan, of course, is a flashpoint. Now, last week there was a report issued by Human Rights Watch that found that commanders from both government forces and rebel groups have been abducting, detaining, and forcing children, some of them as young as 13, into their ranks since the warring party signed the agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan in August 2015. What is your response to those allegations? Our response is that we in the SPLA do not allow child soldiers to be recruited into our rank and files. Where it happens and, and it comes to our notice, we take a swift action. The only two uh, cases I know of were registered in, uh, in former Unity State in 2016, where it came to our attention that we heard some child soldiers uh, in our ranks and file. And when a committee was sent, we were able to register 16 uh, child soldiers, and that number uh, and the list was submitted to UNICEF and, uh, and other partners for demobilization. And we have ever since waited for the process to be, to be completed. Uh, however, we also have had cases of child soldiers that uh, had been recruited by uh, armed groups that were eventually integrated into SPLA. And one particular good example is uh, 
the presence of uh, shell soldiers with the Cobra uh, faction, uh, a rebel group that was absorbed into SPLA some years back. We know that they had about 300 uh, shell soldiers. Uh, the process of integrating them into the army, the Cobra faction is in the process, and we we have said that they have uh, 300 shell soldiers that must be demobilized. So it is not widespread uh, on the side of the SPLA. We have heard limited cases, and those cases have been registered with the relevant authorities. Charles, you now work with trying to help former child soldiers. Could you tell us about what kind of trauma they've experienced and what is the rehabilitation process like for them? Well, you know, as it is, it's quite very difficult. It's a very difficult um, situation because, um, like, uh, you know, as it is, the, the former child soldiers actually have very limited um, coping mechanisms. Hence, because during the conflict in days, what they, what um, we've been indoctrinated to understand or to used to uh, circumstances where um, you can just loot, use a gun and whatever you have to actually get what you want, irrespective of who actually owns that property or the food. And so that's actually a very sad situation because it's in, in the real times, in normal times like now, um, it doesn't happen that way because it's no more in a jungle justice, as we used to call it. It's now a real justice situation. It's now a, 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 democrat, a democratized system where peace prevails and you have to respect all the people. So part of the programs that we do is to enable young people, um, former child soldiers, to be able to have the opportunity to go back to school and become self-reliant and do training program, do training programs, skill training programs for them, and also um, do a lot of psychosocial support, which is the biggest of what we do. Because we found out that um, many of um, our colleague young people, um, they have been disarmed, but their minds are still not disarmed. Even the way they speak, the, the, the tensions they, in their tonation and the manner at which they want to do things still has a very long way to um, showing very strong um, impacts of psychosocial um, um, issues that actually um, that they're living with on a regular basis. So core of our program is a cohort research methodology where we use those who were former child soldiers and those who were not and be able to, we can be able to see exactly um, what um, the, the challenges are. And also, we, we also um, follow through the parents and those who have actually um, gone forward to, and, and marry and then have kids. We're also studying those kids and see how they are transferring violent tendencies uh, from one generation to an all. That's why the project is called Intergenerational Impact of the War. Charles, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Rachel, the UN and other aid groups have said that progress is being made in the efforts to stamp out child soldiers, the use of children in conflicts, but it's not happening fast enough. Could you tell us who are the worst offenders around the world and, and how is the effort to end child soldiers going? Child soldiers are used in conflicts around the world. Um, they always have been. There isn't really a, a specific region where you would say it's worse than another. It's a simply a case of where the conflicts are happening. So at the moment we see a huge amount of conflict in the Middle East, um, so there are many child soldiers there. There are many child soldiers across Africa in conflicts happening there. In the past, there were more in South America, in Colombia, for example, before um, the end of the conflict. So it's not something where there's really, there isn't a culture where this is something that happens particularly. Um, there isn't a particular conflict. It's just um, where the violence is, where children are, they will inevitably be drawn in to some extent or another. So we've seen a lot of progress in the sense of standard setting um, through states ratifying the optional protocol against the use of, ch of child soldiers, um, through other developments that have come, the Safe Schools Declaration to protect children in conflict, the Paris Principles, the Vancouver Principles. So there's a lot of um, apparent will, political will, at that level to address this issue. But what we're seeing is a failure for that to implement on the ground. Um, and put simply, if you're in a conflict situation where community structures, where governmental structures are so damaged and, and so incapable of functioning properly, okay. it's very, very difficult to prevent young people from being drawn into that. We talk about it as if children were recruited as a set moment and that they were demobilized, that they're released, and it's, uh, these are finite things which happen and are done. But that's not the way it works in reality. There's a long process of being drawn in. There can be a long process of coming out again. There can be a lot of going back and forth. 
you have to look at the situations that children are being reintegrated into. If you're in a conflict situation where there is no education, no employment, uh, no safety for your family, no access to food, you can't really talk about children being uh, reintegrated into society because there isn't a functioning society to go back to. And that's why we continue to see um, the problem persisting as much as it has despite the efforts that have been made to stop it because the conflicts themselves uh, are continuing and often they are increasingly involving an element of, of total community involvement. We don't have conflicts the way we did 100 years ago where there would be um, very distinct, separate military forces battling it out on a battlefield. Today what we see is something which is much more um, pervasive that affects entire countries, communities, areas. Um, so trying to draw children out is very, very difficult. Let's now bring in another former child soldier. Ishmael Bea joins us from Abuja. Ishmael was a child soldier in Sierra Leone. Now, Ishmael, tell us about the kind of advocacy you're involved in to help the thousands of children still trapped in wars. How do you go about raising awareness? Um, well, what I tried to do and what I did in my first book that I wrote was to try and put a human face to the story because often I think when people speak about children in armed conflict, uh, particularly in areas where this is not a, an issue, it seems so far removed from the realities of, of people's lives. So what I wanted to write about was to first of all put a human face to show that this is happening to the most vulnerable members of the human society. In addition, uh, that these young people can come back Again, they have a resilient, but with the right care, with the right support, of course, with a reintegration program that is solid, that actually looks at the holistic aspects of how to return somebody back into normalcy and give them an opportunity that people can come back. I'm one of those examples, and so are others around the world. General Koang, critics have charged that most of the militias that have been integrated into the South Sudanese army have child soldiers in their ranks. So what do you do to ensure that those child soldiers don't continue as members once they've been integrated into the South Sudanese army? We make sure that uh, once they are reintegrated into SPLA, all the child soldiers in their ranks and files are registered. Uh, our child protection uh, department is notified. Once they are registered, we also inform uh, the partners like UNICEF, and that's why we're able to demobilize over 300 uh, former child soldiers in, in Yambia uh, after the group that uh, was keeping them in the rang and file was integrated into the SPLA. And this has been our policy. Whenever a rebel group is integrated into SPLA, we make sure that child soldiers do not find their ways into the SPLA ranks and files. And we have done, we have been doing it consistently to ensure that that problem does not spill over to the National Army, the SPLA, which I'm representing. Rachel, another aspect to all this is that the exploitation of girls is also becoming disturbingly common by armed groups. Now, could you tell us more about that specifically? So um, the use of girls as soldiers um, by armed forces, by armed groups, is also something which has, unfortunately, a very long history. Uh, it's only relatively recently that uh, the international community has begun to recognize to what extent girls are involved uh, in conflict. Uh, the stereotypical image of a, of a child soldier is a boy. Um, but in fact, girls in some areas are uh, around half of the children who are involved. Our research in um, DRC has shown that around 40% of the children involved in armed groups there are girls. I understand that uh, the, the use of um, child human bombs that you mentioned earlier uh, by Boko Haram, 66% of those were girls. So girls uh, are very much a part of these groups. Um, they perform a range of functions. Uh, many people are aware of the abduction of girls or the compulsion of girls for use as sex slaves or as so-called brides. Um, but their roles extend far beyond that. They can be involved in fighting, in um, providing uh, support, whether that's carrying goods and weapons or, as Charles mentioned earlier, looting. They cover a very wide range of roles as well, just like boys do. Then when it comes to reintegration, girls have very specific problems, partly because um, they have been overlooked for so long. So, for example, our research in DRC showed that despite the fact that around 40% of children in armed groups were girls, only 7% of those who'd been demobilized um, by the UN had were, were girls. So there was a very large percentage of girls who were going missing somewhere in the process. Um, and there's also often a case with reintegration that there's too much focus on 
short-term practical measures like um, training for a particular career, whether that's as a seamstress or a hairdresser, whatever else. And our research found that this was not meeting the girls' needs and that no one was listening to what it was they were saying that they needed in order to reintegrate successfully. And what that came down to um, in the great majority of cases was girls saying simply, we need to feel accepted at home. We need the community to welcome us back in. Um, we're ostracized, we're seen as tainted, we're seen as having lost our social value as a result of having been involved with these armed groups, particularly girls who came back with babies or who were pregnant when they returned. Um, so we've been implementing uh, programs there to focus much more on the social, the personal, the cultural aspect of reintegration so that children can go back to a community and be welcomed as the person, as the individual that they are. And Rachel, then those so, communities themselves Rachel, sorry can to help girls with education and, and employment. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to pick up on something you said and ask Ishmael, because we're talking about programs to help really severe amounts of trauma. And I want to ask Ishmael about the kind of trauma that is faced by child soldiers, especially as they're trying to reintegrate into society, and what specifically can be done to help them through this. Well, I think that there are different things that have been done. On the psychological aspect, in terms of programs in psychosocial therapy and all of these things, I believe that over the years people have learned how to do it well. Where I believe, uh, based on my experience and also on the work that I do with, with UNICEF and going to some of these environments, what I've seen that needs a lot of work, it's still opportunities that are created for young people after war. Um, there hasn't been very much really thorough market research to really think about how do we give people real opportunities that changes their lives so that they are able to uh, be economically dependent on their own uh, skill sets to be able to do something with their lives. Often when these things don't work, what happens is that the young person ends up going back into the conflict because they feel they, they, they are not useful to themselves or to their community. And in additionally, the communities are not involved in some of how this is done and some of have to think about what it is that we can do for a child after war. For example, in my case, when I came out of a war, if I hadn't had the opportunity to really go to school and discover that I had an intelligence that I can use for something other than the violence that I'd come to know, I probably would have embraced the violence again uh, as, as an alternative. Uh, and so that's really where I believe the key issue lies, the long-term thinking, uh, a real thinking about what do we do for young people when they come out of a war, not just to tell them to be a mechanic, be a plumber. If they want to do that and if there's actually uh, an economic opportunity for that, yes. But let's not just give them a skill set uh, that belittles their intelligence as well. You know? And I think this is where the issue lies. Ishmael, uh, briefly, I, I want to ask you about numbers specifically. A recent report said that international aid provided by governments and international bodies topped $174 billion in 2015, but less than 1% of that was spent on projects fully or partially, partially designed to end violence against children. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm not sure what, what the reason of that is. I'm not sure how the funds are dispersed in terms of where how they are put to certain programs. But again, what I was saying earlier is that I don't think there's a long-term thinking. And additionally, I don't think in the rehabilitation itself and reintegration, there's not a preventive measure being uh, prescribed through these programs to make sure that uh, the communities and the environment where these young people are do not continue to have violence. So in that itself, young people are going to try to come back. You know, I think that people are interested, but I think oftentimes there's a, the way people are focusing on the issue it's not correct. For example, I live in Nigeria now where uh, people talk about Boko Haram. One of the terms that people throw around is de-radicalization. <clears throat> I think it's often quite wrong. I don't think you can, uh, people who find themselves in conflict areas mm -hmm. are not radicalized just by the nature of being there. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's the wrong approach to think about it even in that way. You mm -hmm. know, I think psycho psychological trauma from war is not radicalization. Often people go to war because the situation okay. is already worse off before they get compromised by that, by the wars, you know, so, yeah. Okay. We'll have to end it there. Thanks to all our guests, Ishmael Bea, Rachel Taylor, and Brigadier General Lul Ruai Kwang. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the entire team here, bye for now.